Wish you were one of those influencers with raving fans who binge on your every word, consume all your content, buy everything you have to sell and demand even more? Then stay tuned while Authority Magazine columnist and BuzzFeed contributor Tracy Hazard shares strategies, tips, and tactics from top videocasters, podcasters, authors, and social influencers on creating that bingeable factor. Now, let's join Tracy as she explores how to rise above all the digital noise with The Binge Factor. Hey everyone, welcome to The Binge Factor. I'm Tracy Hazard and I get to interview a friend podcaster today. John Livesey and I have been friends since the start of our podcast journeys and um, and he's just a fantastic podcaster and a beautiful human being. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Um, his show is called The Successful Pitch Podcast. He interviews top investors investors, uh, top speakers, top authors, all kinds of things like that about what makes a pitch really get noticed, what makes sure that you close the deal. So uh, he has a couple of great books that um, originally he did a successful pitch book and I might have been quoted on the cover of it. That's how long we've known each other. When I was writing an ink column, I wrote about him. That's one of the early ways we touch base. And I say on the cover, don't go into your next pitch alone. Take John Livesey, the pitch whisperer, with you. And for those of you who've listened to the show before and you know what I talk about um, when I talk about ego bait, that's the perfect ego bait. When I said that about John, and he not only used it on his website, he not only shared it everywhere in social media, but he puts it on the cover of his book. Now you know you really hit on the right thing. The thing that resonates with them as to being why they feel valuable in the world and what they want others to know about them, but they want it said from an outside source. So this is the perfect example of that. And, and I love that. And John uses ego bait brilliantly through our system. He's been a client a long time and he uses it just absolutely brilliantly because he knows how to craft a phrase like that because he's a wonderful storyteller. And um, you'll hear that when you talk, he's very articulate. But the other things I want to tell you about John is that he's a great keynote speaker. He talks to Anthem Insurance, Coca-Cola. He does a lot of CMO summits. Um, he, his successful pitch podcast is heard in 60 countries, so he gets in, invited to international things as well. Um, he's been on TV, and, he does, and it, a lot of what he talks about is how to ask for you want, uh, what, how to ask for what you want. Boy, I can't even talk today. He, he talks a lot about as an expert on TV about how to ask for what you want and get a yes. During his 20-year TV media sales career he, uh, with Condé Nast, he worked across all 22 brands within their corporate division, and he was recipient of Salesperson of the Year honors. Um, he's the co-founder of, of uh, uh, co-founder CMO of Quantum RE, which is an equity freedom movement um, and a blockchain technology company. So I've also interviewed him on my blockchain podcast, The New Trust Economy. And uh, he has the most adorable King Charles Spaniel. And I'm so sad that he moved from LA to um, Austin, Texas, because our, our puppies have not gotten to meet. Uh, but someday we will make that happen. But I really... Oh, and of course, I guess I'm putting this aside, Better Selling Through Storytelling is his latest book, The Essential Roadmap to Becoming a Revenue Rockstar. And that's really where I think John is brilliant. And I know that you're going to get a lot out of this interview with him because his ability both to tell a story and to latch on to a story, a really great story when he's interviewing, that's some of the best parts about why he's a great example of a very successful podcaster. John, thanks for joining me. So glad you're here. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Tracy. I miss seeing you in person, but I'm glad we're getting to see each other virtually. Yes, that's the new mode. Yeah, that's right. Everything seems virtual nowadays. <laughs> but you've been doing this virtual for a while. You've been making great relationships via your podcast for, I don't know, how many episodes are you at now? You know, I've personally lost track. I think it's over 200. Yeah. For sure. So you have had a lot of interviews and a lot of people mm -hmm. that you've networked with and and, util and in interviewed, but not just interviewed, but like got some great advice from and then built mm. relationships with them longer term. Yes. Tell everybody a little bit about your process with your show. Well, originally it started out that I was going to build my network of investors 
so that I could hear firsthand what they wanted to hear when a founder would pitch them. And I would help the founders with their pitch. And then after they had a good pitch, I could make introductions to the right investors that were interested in that particular niche. So if somebody didn't invest in mobile, it didn't make sense to make that kind of an introduction. And the investors will tell me all kinds of great stuff like, you know, we listen to about 2,500 pitches a year. Uh, we fund 25 and 24 come from a warm introduction. <laughs> so just that one nugget confirmed the research I had read, which was only 1% of pitches get funded and you need a warm introduction. So having that, um, another investor said, please tell your clients, don't boil the ocean. <laughs> That's one a thing, really interesting visual right there. Isn't it? And you know, now I refer to that all the time when I have clients that hire me to give keynote talks to their sales teams and the sales people, I'm working with them on an elevator pitch. I'm like, just say enough to intrigue people to want to know more. Don't boil the ocean. Don't <laughs> tell them everything you do. Oh, right. Okay. Then I remember interviewing Jay Samet. And, uh, oh, I interviewed him too. We loved him. He was great. on our 3D print podcast. I remember. It yeah. was a live thing. You interviewed him um, at an, an event, I remember. Anyway, he said to me about failure from his book, Disrupt You, it's just feedback. Keep going till you get a zombie idea so great it won't die. <laughs> so now when I mention that line, of course I credit him, people laugh, they remember it. So all these little nuggets, I also had the opportunity to interview Robert Kilgalli, who was the famous author. Of oh, I remember that episode. It was one of my favorite ones you did because he's so interesting. Yeah, it's about influence and persuasion, or as he calls it, persuasion. And so this content really um, gave my latest book, Better Selling Through Storytelling, a lot of oomph, as opposed to, I read his book and here's what I got from it, as a lot of authors do, which is fine. I was able to say, when I talked to Robert Caldaldi on my podcast, he told me this, and what that means to you is that. And that's just a whole different credibility of that story. You know, the, the interesting thing though it, that I found was so many times when there were some authors that you've interviewed, interviewed over the years that mm -hmm. they actually were really more dynamic than their books were. So like yeah. it was, it, you know, like persuade, persuasion is a hard book to get through. And I read a lot of books, right? That was a tough book. There's a lot academic. of like, yes. it is, it's a tough book, but he wasn't like that in person. And when you're interviewing no. him, he was very persuasive and, <laughs> and wonderful in person. And so, you know, that's an interesting dynamic that many authors and other people don't get to present themselves away. And I think we think that about investors, like in your particular world, that they're mm. so hands off they're not nice that they're they're harsh and you know and that's not right. the case when you listen to your show well thanks well i pride myself in really asking them questions they haven't been asked before about mm -hmm. and one of the opening questions is what's your story of origin and man people tell stuff about their parents or what they were like as a child <laughs> and every it warms them up to not be so stiff i think and nobody i've ever interviewed has had a linear path you know, and uh, you know, then a few years back, I pivoted and now really interview a lot of speakers and speaking bureaus. And so I've been able to develop relationships with speaking bureaus who uh, have then gone on to represent me. And the way that happened was um, a gentleman named Bernie Swain, who was the founder of the Washington Speakers Bureau, had all the former presidents and you know, Katie Couric, people like that as clients. And um, he had a, a book coming out targeting, you know, about his entrepreneurial journey. And he reached out to me and asked to be on my show. And I was, of course- That's awesome well, when they ask you, right? <laughs> yes. So um, he didn't even know I was a speaker or anything. He just wanted to reach this audience. So I said, of course. Well, Tracy, once you have a big name like that in an industry, then I reach out to other speaking bureaus and say, would you like to be a guest on my podcast? I'm giving you something as opposed to another speaker asking for something. And here's an example of Bernie. And one- um, speaking bureau said, oh, Mike, out of Hong Kong said, oh, I modeled my whole bureau based on his business model. Of course, of course I want to be on your show, right? Yes. <laughs> so I've interviewed about uh, nine of them now. And I have a relationship with them that a lot of, you know, they don't give speakers 30 minutes. No, they so, don't. So, um, you know, they talk about their interest in music and how that influenced their, you know, the combination of music and speaking and the business. And so it's been a fantastic 
way for me as a speaker to build relationships and get known. Right. And there isn't all that much leap between a successful pitch for investors to a successful pitch to a speaking gig, right? <laughs> exactly. You do at the end of the day, it comes down to usually you and one or two other speakers that they made the final three, basically. And the irony is that's my specialty in business is I help clients who are in a bake-off, shootout, whatever you want to call it, whether you're a tech company, a lawyer, architects, executive search firms, you name it, they all go through the same process. They submit a proposal, people, and as a speaker, you know, they look at your video, they read your reviews, and then they say, okay, we'll have a conversation with you and tell us why we should pick you and over somebody else. So those moments, that one hour, that 30 minute phone call you get to sell yourself is um, yeah. everything. And of course, my hope, belief is that storytelling is the key to being memorable. Um, one client said to me, you know, we always ask if we could go last out of three contestants. Uh, <laughs> ah, there is a, did you hear that tip? Go last. <laughs> yes. The problem is you can't control that. Yeah. And so I said, but what you can control is whoever tells the best story. And he said, oh my God, you're hired. You mean if we tell the best story, even if we're first, we'll set the bar for the other people who follow us. That's so right. that's the aha of all of the storytelling. I love that. I love that. You always have such great stories and such great connections, but I'm sure this podcasting start was not that smooth for you. <laughs> so you probably have some funny mistakes, some things that happened. What, what kind of things went wrong? So we don't all feel that you're just so expert and like, oh, we feel like yeah, uh, <laughs> we can well, take this on. Yes. Well, the first time someone said to me, why don't you start a podcast if people are willing to pay you for these introductions to investors after you help them with their pitch, I'm like, why don't I go to the moon? It just seemed impossible. And I realized that I had a lot of fear and I didn't even know what I was afraid of. So I thought, well, let me put some faces on it. So the first fear was the fear of rejection. You probably are not gonna get Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank to be one of your early guests. He might say, mm, I don't think so. If you don't have any episodes for me to hear or any history. Um, but my whole solution to that, Tracy, and this is true for everybody and anything, is don't reject yourself. Just because you get a no, don't reject yourself and don't reject what your idea is. It just means no for now, not no forever. Well, for those of you listening out there, I did a whole episode on the, our Feed Your Brand podcast, which is like this, the sister brother show, like, cause it's Tom and I on that mm -hmm. one. So it's the sister brother show, the husband wife show, whatever, to the binge factor. And John gave an, a really talk about pushing through fear to yeah. to be a podcaster so we will go into more depth on that but yeah you know i think that's it just seems daunting at first doesn't it yeah well and the technology is daunting that's why your service is so wonderful um and my whole line around that is don't go it alone <laughs> don't go it alone there around the fear of the unknown don't go it alone so that's a brilliant brilliant advice so what has been one of the biggest wins for you the best you know authority building biggest win for you I would say recently interviewing Mark Victor Hansen, who's the co-author of the Chicken Soup series, was a big win. He's a win. great guy, isn't he? Really great. And, you know, I met him at a cocktail party and he was coming out with a new book and I knew authors, even if they're as successful as he is, want to promote their book. But it did take, I had to follow my own advice. Take a deep breath, not get attached to the outcome, walk up to him and say, congrats on your new book coming out. I have a podcast. I would love to interview you and your wife, the co-author of it. And, um, you know, he wanted to know lots of specifics. How many people listen, da 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 da, da. You know, it's heard in over 60 countries. You know, All right, reach out to me. And then it really helped develop that very sort of, hi, nice to meet you with a bunch of other people situation into an actual relationship. And um, you guys did a great job producing that episode. And yeah, so, you know, they're wonderful. So I got to, I was lucky enough. I was at an event where I met them and they were doing podcast interviews that we were orchestrating as a part of our mm -hmm. podcast publicity pop-up. So I got my 15 minutes with them there, which was not long enough, mind you, mm -hmm. but, but uh, you know, in, a, in what you do with that time, Mm. Whether it's at an event or, you know, convincing yes. them or actually getting the interview, no matter how small it is, when you get someone that influential and that valuable, 
yeah, you just want to, you want to build that rapport as quickly. So I used every tool in my toolbox and we now have this wonderful little relationship between Crystal, Mark and I, and we just keep referring people back and forth oh. and I'm sharing shows with them. And you know, it's been great now, but that all happened in a 15 minute time span. So like, I understand yes. what you mean. Like, it's so valuable. What can you do in that little quick pitch right there that convinces them to, to go further? The irony is their book is all about asking for what it you is. want. <laughs> and so you have to find the confidence to ask someone like that to be on your show. That's right. That's right. There's a power in ask. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, I want to just do this little section that we have where we talk about some of the tips of, of um, how you set up things, how you do things, how things work for you, and okay. some lessons learned. So mm. can you share some lessons, some stories on your experience um, becoming that sort of center of influence around the pod on, on podcasting and really some of the best ways to book great guests? Mm. That's the first one. Okay. The lesson learned about booking great guests is ask a great guest to introduce you to another guest. Ah, I like that. Ask another great guest. <laughs> Who yeah. else do you know that would be a good guest for this show? Yeah. And you can imagine, especially right after the interview is over, before it gets published, right when you have them, make sure you have that down on your piece of paper next to your computer. If that's a question you don't forget to ask. Yeah. Because that warm introduction again, is everything. Mm, that's a great, that's a great plan. I love that. Um, and it goes to right back to that confidence and power too. So you're building mm -hmm. that along the way, right? right. Um, Just assume they had a great time. And, yeah. yeah. So you, you mentioned before when we were talking that you're, you know, you're not all that focused on the, on the number of listeners or anything, but what do you do to increase listeners? Well, I turn the wonderful transcript that you create every episode into an article on LinkedIn. Ooh. And I tell people I'm creating content every week without writing a word. <laughs> Which is so true, right? Yes. You're, and you're copying who's and pasting a word. <laughs> yes. So, you know, for someone who has written books, obviously that's a nice way to cr create that um, as well. And then um, because of the relationships I've developed with so many of my guests, I'm able to reach out to them and say, I have a new online course based on my book. I have an affiliate opportunity. Would you be interested in promoting it to your listeners since we already have a relationship and they've, you've been on my show? So that is another moment that I don't think a lot of people would notice. I'm running a commercial on my podcast for my own online show, of course. So there's lots of ways to monetize and leverage those relationships. So you just segued into some of the best ways to monetize, which is my next, which is one of my next questions. So, so great. Yeah. I mean, so it's like increased listenership or monetize. Sometimes they're not the same thing and right. it's the power of the activity of that. So that's really one of my other ones is how do, how do you encourage that kind of action and engagement? Well, you do such a great job creating something where the image of the guest with their soundbite is created. So people who are guests that have big social media followings are much more inclined to share that link with that image of themselves and their quote than they might be of all the other shows they've been on, especially if you're launching a book, you're on a lot of shows back to back. So having that really is a factor to increase my um, listeners and get people. To, you're giving them all the easy tools. So they, it's like yes. no brainer for them to, to you know, yeah. Cause, and also they want to reward you. That's the most important part though, that I think you do, John, that you really establish such a great rapport that there's no way they're not going to share it because <laughs> they know it was good. Many people don't like to listen to their own episode after it's recorded. Mm. So they're like, Oh, they worry about it. They get self-conscious. But when you feel good after your interview, right. then you won't worry about it. You'll be, you'll be excited to share it. Correct. And, you know, one of the um, speaking bureaus I interviewed, um, her name is Gail Davis. I happened to interview her right before it was her 20th anniversary. So she used that podcast to promote the anniversary. Oh, nice. The so she had a segue. <laughs> she had a segue. She put it on her website as part of the, you know, because you know, she talked about her journey and, uh, you know, how she started off as an entrepreneur and Great. She didn't obviously. have to make her own article on her 20th anniversary. Lucky her. Exactly. <laughs> That's so nice. Well, besides, you know, I know you work with us, but what do you do on the production side, like on the, on the preparation side to produce it professionally for yourself? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> what do this, you do? Right. <laughs> yeah, two separate questions really for me. What I do to prepare 
is I read the people's book and it seems so obvious. And um, if it's not out yet, I ask for an advanced copy, something. And if do you know even, how few people actually read the book? I get that from authors that I interview all the time. And, yeah. you know, sometimes I don't have time, but it's barely that I try not to yeah. do that. And it separates me from everyone. You know, the first Does. time I did it, someone said, oh, you know, you're one of the few journalists that read my book. I could tell by the questions you ask, you know, when you say on page this, you say that. How'd you come up with that? You know, yeah. whatever it is, very specific questions. Um, or what I love most about what you did is yeah. insert X, Y, Z, even if it's just a, you know, a chapter title. Um, and if someone's got a great testimonial on their book, I'll say, how did you get that relationship? <laughs> you, know, you know, they're usually very proud of that, especially if it's somebody famous. Yeah. Uh, so all that is part of my preparation. And also, I, before we start recording, I have a whole little song and dance I do, which which sounds like this. I'm not going to put it to music. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, really excited to have you on the show today, Tracy. I just want to um, let you know this is being recorded. It's not live. So what that means to you is you can stop and start as many times as you want. You can cough. You can say, let me think about that. Let me go get that piece of book or uh, don't worry about it. And if the listeners feel like they're eavesdropping in on a couple of friends, and in this case they are, having a conversation, that's the tone we want. Again, the old goal is to inform, inspire, and entertain them. Any questions? Dude, that's awesome. I love that. You disarm them and make them feel comfortable right from the beginning. There's no nervousness. There's none of this like feeling like they have to prepare. Right. <laughs> ironically, I did that with someone who hadn't been on many podcasts. And then I said, I'm going to do a quick countdown for the editors. Three, two, one. And they freaked out. Thinking, <laughs> oh my God, we're going live. So I have to really make sure that and I'm going to do a countdown. There's a new line. Yeah. So those are some. It's, it's a verbal cue. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Well, so, you know, that's so important, but that makes for a more professionally produced show. And I hear that a lot from guests. So those that are, you know, cause I work with a lot of agents and a lot of PR firms and other things, and they place their clients um, on a lot of our, our clients shows. Mm -hmm. And that's what I get back is like, there are, there's a real distinct difference between those that prepare and those that don't. Yeah. And so it's one of the things I now know to ask, like how, how serious are your clients about these mm. interviews? Like how, how do they react? How do they, what do they want to experience? And that, helps me choose the shows to be honest oh, with you that I, I refer people to if so. I had one tweet I was going to give you from this show it would be your pre and post chat is more important than what you say on the show oh I love it there you go uh editors make sure that that's again that turns into our, our tweetable which we do here guys I figured. Um, yeah so because, and it's important yeah. that you're so right yeah so I just gave you what I say before the show then after the show, I've got my little checklist. Who else do you know to be a guest? Let them know they did a great job. That's one of the things I remember when Oprah Winfrey said, I don't care how big the star was, as soon as the uh, show was over, they go, how'd I do? <laughs> Everybody I think, wants- I think the bigger star, did, if you ever saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the bigger the star, the more neurotic about that they probably yes. were, right? <laughs> so they, you can never over compliment them too much. Yep. And again, when you give someone a compliment, be very specific. Right. So, yeah, you know, I always do that. I like, you know, I really enjoyed your energy. I thought we were uh, in sync. I think that went really well. Like, that's the kind of specificity. I love that you mentioned that because that's always really good. And then don't make them ask. Tell them when it's going to air. Yeah. Let yeah. them know what's coming. And um, then now you record really far out. So I want to I want to I want to touch on that. So you're you record pretty far out. You're, you're I mean, you're way ahead of your production schedule. How does that go? Because I think when I talk to a lot of people who want to guess, I, I advise them to get way ahead of when they want to, you know, they think they could just go on like radio and TV and it's yes. instant and podcasting is not the same way. And right. the better shows have a backup of, of episodes. It can be 90 days to 180 sure. days sometimes before you you'll air. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that with your guests? Well, if someone's got a book coming out and it's really crucial to them that this episode airs during the week of the launch, I will move someone else that doesn't have a deadline like that back a week and move them up in the production queue. Um, but for the most part, it's all about managing expectations mm. and just saying, 
you know, part of, you know, this, ever since I had, you know, so-and-so on, there's been a big demand. And so, you know, it airs once a week. The next open air time is this time. And most people are fine with it as long as you tell them. They're like, okay, unless they have a book. Yeah. Right? Well, your and show's I, worth waiting for. So there uh, you go. <laughs> well, before I, we get to why your show's worth waiting for, I want to I want to mention that you have developed books from your show. And I, I want to touch on that. So is this the the third? So Better Selling Through Storytelling, is that the third book, if I'm not wrong? It is, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So tell everyone a, a little bit about the process for putting the books together. Well, I was doing this in a vacuum, not knowing that Tim Ferriss was doing the same thing at the same time. So I thought to myself, well, I'm in good company. I love yeah. that. <laughs> Once you find that out, right? <laughs> that whole tipping point thing. Um, that people have the same idea that you do. So I took 10 of my favorite episodes and ironically, they tend to be people who have a big social media following. And I asked them if they would be willing to be a chapter in my book. And they all said, yes. And um, I also asked if they would promote the book. And they said, of course, cause I'm in it. <laughs> so right there, you have it done. And then the transcripts that you guys create for me are so well done. It was just a matter of editing it out. Welcome to the show things like that. So it didn't yeah. feel like you were list reading a transcript of a show. Um, and, you know, it's still a lot of work, don't get me wrong. But it was, I was able to get it done in four months. And, you know, you get somebody to write the forward. In this case, it was the wonderful Judy Robinette. And then you get some testimonials. So the fact that it wasn't my first book really helped the process. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I know you and Tom came to the book party and ironically ran into another guest that I had on who's got Who his own. Who we've known for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> we were just, we just saw him again a, a couple nights ago too. So <laughs> yeah, he's so great. Um, so that's the joy of the world of podcasting and authors and, um, and now more than ever, podcasting is really important for authors. So, so now I want to understand. So did you, did you launch a book without the sort of podcast model before? So you said it wasn't your first book or this, oh, this it wasn't. is the most recent? Well, my first book was 16 years ago, and that was just a book about selling, the seven most powerful right. selling secrets. So, so, so yeah. So how did you find it? Did you find it so much easier to promote and launch the book than it was 16 years ago? I mean, just uh, was it um, easier or not? Well, when I, the writing of the book and the launching of the book, as you know, are two big different yeah. projects. So the writing of the book was much easier because the content was already there. Right. Um, the promotion of the book is the same, whether it's based on a podcast or not. So I had the book and the podcast be the same name. So that's one tip, obviously. It seems so obvious, but some people may think, oh, I'm going to change. Don't do that. If you're going to base your, the successful pitch is the podcast and the successful pitch is the book. Great tip right there. <laughs> I love it. Yes. But it does allow you to get a book. Well, I'm making a note right now because I still haven't finalized the cover to my book. Yep. Uh -huh. So there you go. Now I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Great. John's great tip. Well, that's fantastic. Now, are you, um, are you thinking audiobook next? Well, on this last book, Better Selling Through Storytelling, I did use uh, created an audio book of it. You did. Oh, and I didn't realize that. I, yes. not, I'm not an, for a, for a podcast listener, I'm not an audio book listener. So right. it's not my first go-to check. <laughs> I understand. And actually the audio book is doing amazingly well. Now here's a tip for any authors that might be listening that happen to host a podcast. I highly encourage you to record the audio book before it goes to press. Why? You will catch a typo. I promise. <laughs> you I don't care how many, issues with your book, right? <laughs> I don't care how many copy editors and you and other people have proofed it. When you read it out loud, it took me about six hours, three two-hour sessions. Oh, wow. You did it really fast. Uh, is that fast? Okay. Yeah, compared to a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was another hour to, for pickups, like, oh, you mispronounced Hoda's last name and things like that. Yeah. Um, and your energy, oh, <laughs> your, your energy can't stay up much longer than two hours is what they found. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, to me, that would be very long. 
But I tell you, Tracy, hosting a podcast really allowed me to be a good narrator for my book. The guy said, you could do voiceovers. I'm like, I'm happy being a speaker. I don't need to do a whole other industry. <laughs> but, but if it, everything falls apart in the speaking world, you got a backup plan. <laughs> yes. I love it. Well, you know, this is the thing. Like the, we, we were just working with a new group about doing, putting together uh, audiobook plans for podcasters with the whole marketing launch and plan together. Mm -hmm. So we're, it's really, this episode will probably air after we announce it to our client base. We probably won't to announce it publicly, but announce mm -hmm. it to our client base um, because they're uniquely suited to be able to do it e in an easier way because they already understand our production process. So right. we'll, we'll launch it there first. We'll beta test it with our own clients. And one of the things that in the research I was doing, the reason I was so excited to be able to find someone to bring it on to help do with the audio book recording training side of it mm -hmm. is that podcast hosts should record where there are a lot of authors who should never read their own book. Right. But it would be disconcerting to your podcast fans to mm. not hear your voice, John. Like it would yes. bother me if it was just some <laughs> random voiceover artist. Right. So. Especially since I have so many personal stories in my book. And if somebody else was telling my story, it would be a it, big disconnect. It I just wouldn't sell, tell the same yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I personally, I love it when I listen to a celebrity autobiography, you know, Goldie Hawn, Robert Wagner, whoever, and they are reading their own book. I'm so in. Yeah, but there are certain people who shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, absolutely. I love that. Well, let's talk about your binge factor. So now, you know, we talk about binge ability as meaning that someone picks up your show and then they listen to it again and again and they go through mm. all the episodes. And at some point in the process, they probably reach out to you. Mm -hmm. So now I'm usually identify the binge factor for people, but I know that you know so well what really plays. What do you think your binge factor is? I would say my binge factor is the variety of guests that I get Ooh. who, but everyone has, I guide them to tell a story and one, and so people know when they're coming to the successful pitch, they're going to learn something about storytelling and they're going to hear really interesting stories about people who are famous and people who aren't famous, but are still really interesting. Yeah. Um, whether they, and they'll learn some entrepreneurial tips along the way. Um, so I would say that I pride myself in asking the guests questions other people haven't asked them by my preparation. And so I, if I had to guess what I think is a, a sticky binge factor would be was, oh, I can't wait to see what he's going to ask so-and-so. <laughs> well, you know what, that, that's sort of tied to what I, what I believe that your binge factor is, John. Mm. So you, you sort of got it out halfway of what I, what I was going to uh, say. Please, I'm curious. Yeah. Here, yes, so yes. it is that I want that the way that you ask questions and the way that you pull stories out of people, especially people who might be a little reluctant and sometimes mm -hmm. you get them, especially when you were doing more of the investor mm. where they're not as outgoing, right? It was mm -hmm. harder to get the stories out of them. Right. And so, you know, you're great at doing that and you never do it with the same question. There's a lot of interviewers who ask the same question every single time the same way you don't do that it's got great variety and deep research you can hear it in the way that you do that so that's really great but what i really think the binge factor is is that you bring quality people like really interesting quality people and i don't have time as a listener to go out there and research all these great books that I should be reading and, uh -huh. you know, finding great stories out there, understanding, you know, interesting people. I, they're, like you said, they, they're not just the famous ones, the ones who are getting the biggest publicity. They're uh -huh. all over the place. But the key factor that you have to them all is that they're all extremely interesting. Mm. And so I can't tell you how many times I've downloaded a book from someone who was on your show oh, or great. done those things. So, you know, I wish I, I wish I had time to listen to your show consistently every week, but I get a little <laughs> backed up and then I, I, I get a little choosy about it. But, you know, but when I do listen, I'm, I'm always like, wow, that was so great. And oh, John asked the great question. So, and, and that's also something I think as a listener, you don't leave it on the table. Like, mm that's that always is problematic when those that watch the clock too when they're when they're recording mm. you don't do that i can tell no. i mean you you're, you're not going to rush them to tell their story you're not going to rush mm -hmm. them to finish up and get on to the next thing so it is the length that it should be and that is also great for me i didn't miss out on the the whole story mm. oh thanks I, i'm glad to hear that that really lands <laughs> and i just recently interviewed rob angel who's the creator of pictionary and has a, I haven't yeah, heard that one yet. <laughs> that comes out in uh, June. Okay, good. And, and I thought to myself, what a fascinating story That's of entrepreneurship, of persistence, 
and I can't wait for people to hear that. So for me, I am like a little kid on Christmas morning. I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to talk to you. <laughs> That's great. It that is thing. my favorite thing. Like I was so excited that we get to talk today. So yeah. I agree with you. That is one of my favorite parts. Well, well, I just want to make sure I'm going to just do a little quick shout out to the show, thebingefactor.com. That's where you'll be able to link to John's podcast, The Successful Pitch Podcast. Make sure that you subscribe so you get that wonderful story about the creator of Pictionary. So like, I mean, why don't miss that. So if it hasn't aired yet, if it has aired, we'll link it in the blog post for this episode. But if it hasn't aired, aired yet you got to go subscribe to the show and check it out mm -hmm. and you should anyway mm -hmm. but now john before we go i want to just say what kind of advice do you have for those that are sitting in you, you heard me say this before permanent potential like they keep thinking i should start a podcast i should make, mm -hmm. i should produce a book i should you know whatever i should do these things and they're sitting there though holding themselves back what advice do you have for them my advice is don't go it alone and that's the number one reason people don't start is they feel like I got to do it all myself and then they get overwhelmed and then they go down this rabbit hole of distraction. And I think you have to zoom out and say, what am I doing this for? What's the purpose? What's my intention? Is it to help people that has to be bigger than your intention to make money. And if you have that as your driving force, you will get it done. You know, I think it's so ironic that this is the way you're ending this show with me because when I wrote that blurb that's on the cover of your book, <laughs> The Successful Pitch Book, I called you the pitch whisperer. You did. And, but I, what I specifically said to people was, don't go into your pitch without uh, John, right? Don't go it alone. Yeah. Exactly the same message. So thank you, John, mm -hmm. for sharing that with us. I really appreciate your time today. No, oh, Tracy, thank you for all you do for everyone and you inspire us all to be better. <laughs> I told you he was going to be incredible. I told you you're going to learn so much from John Livesey. Be sure to tune into the Successful Pitch Podcast. You're not going to want to miss it. You're not going to want to hear what I was talking about as his binge factor. Hear that incredible way that he pulls people's stories through the show and he manages to get it out of them. Um, and, you know, you heard his voice. It's a beautiful voice to listen to. So it's a really great show overall. And I know you're going to get a lot out of it. So the Successful Pitch Podcast is available on all podcast players out there. But there will be links to uh, his show and this episode. There'll be all links to any of the things that he mentioned in there, including that episode with the founder of uh, Pictionary. Um, and we will make sure that all of that is at the blog post for this episode at thebingefactor.com. So thanks everyone from li for listening. I can't wait to bring you another successful podcaster and a new angle on The Binge Factor. Wish you were one of those influencers with raving fans who binge on your every word, consume all your content, buy everything you have to sell and demand even more? Then stay tuned while Authority Magazine columnist and BuzzFeed contributor Tracy Hazard shares strategies, tips, and tactics from top videocasters, podcasters, authors, and social influencers on creating that bingeable factor. Now, let's join Tracy as she explores how to rise above all the digital noise with The Binge Factor.